Good day. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Whenever you're viewing this, this is another edition of Purple Points. And I'm very honored and excited to have my guest today. I have the most wonderful and great, good Dr. Tracy Curry, who is a spoken word artist. She is also a professor at University of Michigan Flint campus. Uh, she is a woman of many talents and abilities. So it's an honor and pleasure to have her here on Purple Points. Dr. Curry, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dr. Houston, AK. I'm so excited. <laughs> this is good. This is really good. So I'll jump right into it. When you hear the color purple, what tends to come to mind? Uh, um, thus, <laughs> I go in my performance mode, I wore the color <laughs> purple. Um, a lot of things come to mind. So the book comes to mind. Uh, yeah, in terms of when it came out, the 1982, and then the movie obviously comes to mind. That's 1985, obviously, and and I'm merging, and I say that specifically because uh, I have, I don't know, I don't know when I got my copy, but I know I was looking at the copyright date, and it's funny how it says copyright, you know, copywritten 1982, but printed 1985 when the movie came out, and so for me, significantly, uh, my I remember going to the movie first, seeing it with my mother. So when you say what comes to mind, relationships, women, um, language, dialect, uh, community, empowerment, sadness, tears, <laughs> the lexicon, like there's just a lot. It's not just one thing, it, it, it spans and it intersects and Sexism, racism, ageism, classism. <laughs> so a lot of things come to mind. Okay. Yeah. So obviously uh, you've taught the novel before and you've had your students watch the film as well. Uh, when you are teaching the novel, what kind of things do you focus in on? I noticed that in your conversation you're saying that relationships, women, and dialect are among the most prominent things that come to mind. So in your teaching of the novel and using the film, what are some of the tools that you use to kind of tease out these ideas around women, relationships, and dialect? So the most important thing for me, honestly, is the language. I, I think, I, hands down, I think it's something peculiar and powerful and phenomenal that, I, that Alice Walker does with the book um, that starts this whole dialogue for me. Um, it's the fact that she chooses to write it in letters. It's the fact that you know, the first few letters um, operate in being pretty short, you know, a few paragraphs long, but if you write it on a piece of paper, you know, depending on the the the, the handwriting and stuff, it's about a page, page and a half. Um, you learn a lot, a lot, lot about this young woman, at least in the first two, three letters. Um, and, and for me, it's just looking at the language, you, she has just identified herself and she being Sealy, right? When I go, when I move uh, or transition into the film, what I learn, especially with the students that I'm teaching, at least in the past, is that they're aware of the film first before they're aware of a book. And so at that point, I have to have that dialogue like, <laughs> the movie follows and follows in distance the book. Right. And so you have. And so for me, there is no choice but to start with the book first. And, and, and it goes beyond people saying, you know, be, books are better than movies. You usually hear that. But just I have to start with the book because of the way she writes it and that um, and that it informs everything that you see and you don't see in the film. Uh, and so that's usually what happens. And truth be told, I'm, I'm trying to remember the last time I, I taught the book because it's, it's been a while. Truth be told, what I usually do is, for the most part, depending on what class it is, I was working with pre-college program that uh, was preparing students for the health field, usually nurses, when I, was, when I was teaching the book. And so for me, what was most important is the relationship part um, and relationship between women. So I push the envelope, whether there are men and women in the class or not, there is usually predominantly a lot of women in the class, but I push, push, push like crazy that relationship between women. And then what I do is 
I have them figure out what that relationship looks like between letters. Because for me, that's, that's my upbringing is pen and paper, fold it up, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it and send it out. But you know, in the 21st century, if you start talking about pen, paper and, and, and stamps, it, at least from my experience, the generation starts looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, so I, I think it's always important to start with how do you even feel about letters? Like who's still writing letters? And if you do write letters, when, when did you write your first letter? Who taught you to write that first letter? That for me then begins sh to shape what the movie looks like. Because uh, honestly, the movie starts with, the movie starts with, if I recall, music in the background, Celie walking on the road, and then in her open, and I remember this specifically, in her opening line is the first paragraph of the first letter. But then you jump down, then she goes to what, the third paragraph? And then she generally tells you who you are. So pretty much at that point, you have to piece, piece the letters together based off of the film. After okay. you get past those two paragraphs that come directly out of the first letter. Okay. Right? So, so in some ways, the film is a, an attempt at a literal translation of the text. Um, but of course, you know, when you get into other scenes, most often what comes to mind, and again, you said relationship. So I'm thinking of the relationship uh, between Seeley and Suge most prominently, that that translation sometimes from the text doesn't actually work to the screen. And we could argue, you know, the, the politics of the time period and right. then the uncomfortableness with dealing with the same gender love and kind of dynamics that the book explores that we don't necessarily see in the film. And I think that that's probably among the most prominent of the letters in the film, if we're talking about it. But I think something else you raised, you said the relationship between women and the dialect. And so one of the things I kind of wanted to ask is how does your experience with women and dialect inform the way you see the film? So what are some of the connections you can draw from, you know, maybe conversations you've had with other women or relationships that you're in? And it could be, you know, however you want to take that, family, friends, fictive kin, uh, whatever. I'm just kind of interested in this dynamic of relationships and dialect. Okay, so it, it's, it's <laughs> I'm going to go like 50 million ways, and then you, Akil, will have to draw me back because, <laughs> you know, I'll go in every direction. Um, and, and I so want to talk about that relationship with Suge and Seeley. That's, for me, absolutely pivotal because that speaks to how she begins identifying herself in my opinion um and and, and there's a beautiful translation in trying to understanding what that looks like in the book to the film but dialect and and, and language and how it relates to me right and and the women that i'm talking to so this is the thing Celie's the main character, right? And, and Celie's surrounded by all these women. And what I think I love about the book, even slash film, um, my, my entrance, of course, is the film first, and then, I, and then I go back to the book. And I go to the book knowing that I love to read. I don't even remember how I got to the book. I just know that at some point it was in my hands. But when I, when I think of the language, I think the pivotal one of the most powerful things is Seeley's conversation. This whole idea of, I remember in, in class some time ago, I would have this conversation with some of the young women about the way you talk, and this is just strictly training for me, the way you talk, that may not always be the best way to write, right? Like that's, that's in, in this notion of formal education, the four walls and how we teach our students, how we prepare them for the world, whatever the world looks like, based off of where we are in the United States, right? Based off of what school and what kind of job you want and who you're gonna come across and how you come in and out of language, how it intersects. So for me, that's the same thing that I see in this book, which somehow comes out slightly, slightly in the film, but you, you kind of don't really know. All you're doing is just, you're listening. So she, she wonderfully, like for example, she, there's, a, there's a letter in here where she, uh, and she says this a lot, I asked. Well, you know, for us translation, ask, A-S-T equals ask, 
right? <laughs> right? Um, mm -hmm. She talks about having the disease, uh, not the disease, but she talks about two sicknesses. And I thought this was so fly, diarrhea and pneumonia. Diarrhea, she starts with D-I-R-E, right? Like mm -hmm. this dire need. Pneumonia, and this is so phonetic, is pneumonia, N-E-W, monia, M-O-N-Y-A. And I right. was like, that's so yeah. hot, right? <laughs> that's fly because let's be real, we're in this world where we're trying to validate ourselves and validate our language and validate how we speak, how we write, but we, but in recognizing, honestly, if I start start writing phonetically and start breaking out how I say things um, and, and translating it on the page and handing it in as a paper to my professor or to whomever or to a journal, that just won't fly, right? Like we, we know that. So it's almost as if you have to know the game before you can play with language. So Alice Walker being Alice Walker, yeah, she knows the game. Seely being Seely, she's speaking from the heart she's she's just she's speaking who she is that identifies her and for me in many ways on one end yeah it's their letters but on another end this is one whole spoken word piece and that's okay. i think that's what makes it powerful for me is okay uh, on one end i'm sure some people somebody's saying tracy that's bs you're stretching here because this is how you define spoken word but let's consider the fact that We've taken this book and turned it into a film and turned it into a play. So that means now it becomes words being spoken for the whole world in a performative style. That's spoken word. That's like poetry across the board. And I do think it's powerful, whether I agree with the story or not, or how it's translated on uh, in the film, I, I do agree with the, the idea that you can be creative and you can play with images and language and body motions so that we can figure out what that looks like. If I take your question now, let me try and answer this. So if, if I go back to your question about, um, so <laughs> bring it back to your circle, Tracy. Hey, I'm, I'm with Seelies of the world. I mean, that's, that's who I work with. And I think one of the reasons why I um, work well or get along or, or love to work with my youth, and I'm saying my youth would be in the high school, whatever that age range is, whether it's 12 to 18, or let me just be very direct, why I work in the juvenile detention center, why I work with pre-college programs, is because that population right there, they remind me of me. Now granted, you know my you know my history so if you look at my if you if you look at my background i can see enough people saying okay tracy you, you you're privileged you come out of a two-parent household middle class i get all that but i also get that i grew up a little bit shy i also get that for the longest time i was i was putting my hand over my mouth and i was pulling the sealy move and it took a mentor to say i need you to stop that i need you to smile you have a pretty smile it took all of that stuff for me to get the braces off, for me to actually smile, stare at myself for a little bit, actually accept my nose, my eyes, and whatever that looks like to figure that thing out. Those are my sealies, right? Um, those sealies are my netties also. So I have, a, I have one of my close girlfriends, Nick and I, we always do, and I'm not too sure who's Sealy or Nettie between us, but whenever we see each other, we always do the little clap <laughs> at the very end of the movie, right? And we always embrace ourselves in a hug and we fall down on the ground and we've just had a little, the, the purple color, the color purple moment, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think the reason why this book is pivotal for me is because you're right, like 30 years later, or even if we go back to whatever the book is, you know, 82 into now, it still remains as far as I'm concerned. I mean, change things around a little bit, but I think what's profound is one, no one can tell your truth better than you can. And I think for me, what Alice Walker does is I get that people say it's a fictional story. I have a problem with this. I have a problem with that. But yet and still, it's her story. And she has the right to write whatever she wants. And at some point, as far as I'm concerned, she hits somebody. She hit Tracy. It worked for me. So when I read parts, when I read parts about Celie trying to figure out her sexuality, I was like, my God, are you kidding me? That blows me away. And how Suge and her are trying to figure that out together, um, or not even trying to figure that out together, how in the book, 
it does some things that you have to use your imagination. But in the movie, you see the visual. So you see mm -hmm. the of Seely sitting there and, and Suge is kissing her on the shoulder or kissing her on the sides or kissing her on the forehead. And so I'm going back and forth between, wow, that's what discovery looks like. Discovery looks like whomever that woman is or whomever that best friend or mentor or family member is sits right, she sits right in front of you and she tries to unlayer you so you can figure it out for yourself. She's that sister friend that says, stand in front of the mirror, I need you to look at yourself. And when, and when I saw that book to movie and saw that in myself, I realized that's the same thing I'm bringing into spoken word class. So I do an activity I know I'm talking a mile a second, but it's all good. It's all good. I'm enjoying the conversation. I do an activity where is my uh, where I ask the students. I say, you know, do you know what you look like? And they're like, do you know what you you know? Do I know what I look like? Yeah. And I said, mm -mm, no, no. Do you know what you look like naked? Like how many of you stand in front of the mirror naked? And and I and for me that's that's important because uh, you know spoken word body language, its appearance, and it's obviously the words that you're speaking. But in the book, you know, there's about two, three sections when Celie's like, I hate myself. I, mm -hmm. I hate the way I look. Then she comes back later, um, so further down, and she talks about how I don't even understand why Suge loves me. <laughs> like, I don't even get it. Um, but somewhere in the midst of that same conversation that's on paper, she comes down and says, all I have is like my heart, or maybe I should quote this correctly, but all I have is my heart and my light. You know, she's talking about the inner side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I think in terms of me and how it relates to my circle, that's what I do now. And I'm not even 13, 14 anymore, but I hate the fact that I still do that mess that I kind of retreat and do and have a silly moment. And I'm just like, I don't like the way that I look. And then I have to have the girlfriend, the Ayanas of the world, who's just like, you know what? I need you to move forward, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I need you to stop all that and bring it back. So this, this book slash movie does a lot for me as it relates to women relationships and what that can look like and how we love each other. I think that that's, that's the key. Loving each other, and it's difficult to do when you don't know how to love yourself. So these moments of self-discovery and agency that Celie has, and, and let's be honest, the world can be a pretty awful place in terms of black girls uh, figuring out who they are and what beauty is on their own terms. You know, some media outlets will have you believe that you can't be pretty unless you've got a pink wig, a purple wig, and you have a certain aesthetic. And not to say that that's not beautiful to some folk, but it really challenges this idea that I can be beautiful just being who I am. And so maybe Celie doesn't write in the language of, uh, you know, some feminist scholar or womanist scholar, African womanist scholar, but she speaks, as you said, from her heart and from her light. And so in that space of vulnerability and honesty, she's able to say, I don't know, but I'm learning and I have people along the way who are helping me. And to quote uh, Ayala Van Sant, you know, she's gaining her peace from her broken pieces. Right. Uh, and, you know, you see so much of the legacy of pathology in the film when it comes to Celie. You know, here she has this relationship with her mother and you get that she loves her mother. And early on she talks about, you know, feeling sorry for her mother rather than rejecting her mother as she does seemingly with men in the movie in terms of looking for love and affirmation. Right. Um, so, you know, when I think about the film, there aren't these moments, unless you've read the book, where you understand part of what Celie's, her stuff is. And so I like the fact that, well, I kind of like this in some ways because it forces you to say, I need to read the book if you haven't read the book. Right. Um, because, you know, the curious of what you think, you know, just building on this, this trifold of relationships, women and dialect, I find it, the book gives you some insight into the development of um, almost this trinity between Suge, Sophia, and Seely, and how they both, like, come together to support the other one. And it's at different moments in the story. So one of the things that's really striking is how Seely, in many respects, is childlike throughout much of the film. You could argue the novel, even as she's um, maturity-wise a woman. And it takes 
the energy of Sophia, the energy of Shug to kind of help her find her own. And then she looks at Sophia as this odd, weird woman. And I think in the letter she argues that, you know, she's solid. But she doesn't quite know what that is or what that means. But then as they get to know each other, they find that they have these similar struggles. So she's dealing with um, issues around sexuality, uh, incest, sexual assault, and trying to figure that out. And then you find as she begins to have conversation with Sophia and um, Suge that that's, that's an issue. Like, it's not just you. There's something going on here. There's an illness that's happening here, a sickness, pathology, however you want to word it. It's a thing. Uh, and I think when Sophia says that famous line, you know, girl, child ain't safe in a house of men's, you know, there's so much in that line. Um, you know, you can take that so many ways. And so what I'm interested in, I kind of want to go back to a conversation we had years ago, and uh, I'm, I'm disclosing some stuff. This is not too, too deep, but <laughs> when we were in film school and we used to have conversations about the color purple. And so one of the things that I felt like, I was like, you know, I don't know if this film gives enough context to what's going on in the conditions of black folk. Yeah. And I think one of the things that unfortunately is a result of, you know, maybe some of the literature in African American studies and certainly the the male energy there is that we don't often look or equate what's going on with women as critical, as important. Uh, so some of those nuances in terms of sexual assault, uh, intimate partner violence, uh, even the psychological abuse that Seeley is experiencing. We don't often look at that and say, this is worthy of struggle. This is worthy of attention in terms of social justice. So social justice, generically speaking, um, black men, police brutality, racism, um, but it's a very narrow notion of racism. So I think the film really forces us to think about these things in a way that it impacts women from a womanist perspective. So, you know, I like this, this idea that you you have, you've laid, out, you've laid out in terms of relationships with women in dialect. Um, so going back to the movie a little bit, how do you think the film does in showing that relationship between the three of them, Suge, Sophia, and Celia? I mean, you've read the book a bunch of times and you've seen the film, so do you feel like the film does justice to their supportive relationship, and are there particular scenes that you feel like are good illustrations of that? Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize I was gonna be this excited <laughs> to get into the, feel like I haven't had this dialogue about the color purple in, in a while. Okay, so here we go. You sure is ugly, right? You remember that, that whole- I do. And the repetition, you sure is ugly. Is that not abuse? Right. Um, and so I, I feel like there's this the, less we forget sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Such a lie. I don't know who came up with that rhyme. Right. Mm -hmm. and so as far as I'm concerned, um, names and words break spirits. And so so I find it funny. And, and I'm and I'm trying to make a very clear division with the, the film. I have a tendency to blur them blur them both, but I think there is a very clear division. I'm I'm thinking in terms of when the the initial relationship with Suge and and Seely. So mm -hmm. they have a relationship before Suge even gets in the picture. Right? Because we have Seely who's hearing about Suge, Suge this, Suge that, Suge this. So she's almost like enamored and fall in love with this with like she's on lock about on who Suge is in a way before she gets there. Now, granted, I don't know if I got that from the book or if I got that from the movie. But if I think in terms of the movie, I'm recalling just the two, three scenes that, that come to mind. Sugar's drunk off her ass. <laughs> she shows mm -hmm. up. Um, she's insulting Seely. And, and instead of Seely like running away, I mean, I think she's almost accepted because Seely's, She's all she's already inward. And and I and I'm not the word's not coward. It's she's already in retreat. Like she's she's a cocoon and and a snail and all the things that have to do with not coming out of your your shell. So it's almost as if if Suge is throwing out all these 
these words that aren't feel, they're not feel good or they're not compliments. If you notice in that scene, I think the scene is when she's in the, the tub, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they're like get out my face, <laughs> you know, what you doing? Leave me alone. She has that cigarette. Celie's too busy just trying to take care of the woman. Like she's so, it's almost like she totally dismiss it, totally does not recognize that she's being insulted in the midst. She's just kind of like, you know, let me take the cigarette out. Let me wash your feet. Let me scratch the stuff out of your hair. And so in many ways, I almost feel like there's a transformation with Shug. Not okay. Because Celie's already there. She's, she's caught up, caught up because Shug is Shug. Shug is, mm, this is it. But but once again, the book doesn't, the, the movie doesn't do this. So I do yeah. have re reference to the um, the book. And the correct picture me. when it comes out and she sees it and she wants to keep it. What, say that again? The picture, the picture of Shug when uh, Mr. goes asking for Nettie's hand and there's the picture that comes out and she wants to keep oh, it. Oh, I wasn't even thinking that. Yeah, because I mean, in in the movie, you don't see. That's that's how the advantage of reading is. And of course, you know, I would say I'm I'm like you. I enjoy reading, but in the movie, there isn't this sense of buildup around Suge Avery. I mean, you get it. It's not, it's not the same as the the book. So yeah, you're right. So because the example I was it. So that's a great example. The example I was going to give was the fact that Celie wants to go shopping for Suge, and she's just like, I would like to see her in purple and a hot purple and a tint right. of red representing royalty but you know exactly what you said we don't we we know suge as a character that is helping to to shape Celie, but she is and i get that Celie is the main character but one of the reasons why she becomes the main character obviously in the book uh, well, well because she's the main character but it's almost like she's writing the she's the one writing these letters, right? Whereas right. with the movie, Celie's a central character, but there's these characters that revolve around her to shape and, and help her figure out who she's at, who her, what her identity is. So she comes in and out. Sophia comes in and out. Squeak, minor wise, comes in and out. Of course, Nettie. Nettie's probably the closest thing that doesn't necessarily come in. She doesn't necessarily come in and out. She's like that riding force. So I think, I bring it back, Sophia and, and Shug. Um, it starts what feels volatile because because I think the film means it to to show this kind of volatility. This this mm -hmm. idea that Shug is just like, who are you? But I don't really think it actually does that. If you if you stare at C, if you watch Celie and Suge, Celie has always been steady with how she feels. And mm -hmm. a matter of fact, all it does is she just grows. She grows more and more in love to That's the true. point where it becomes a bit overwhelming. Um, so what do you what do you think about this? So okay. as I'm reading the novel in my head right now, I remember her saying that she felt sorry for her mother right okay. before her mom dies. And so I'm wondering if she sees elements of her mother and Shook because her mother is fussing and cussing at her, if I remember the, the novel correctly. And she does, she's not mad. She's just like, I feel sorry for her. So I wonder if Shook is in that same space where she's like, I know there's more to this woman. Um, and so I know she needs her back scratch, her hair wash, whatever. And right. we'll find out who she is because there's this curiosity that she has, you know, whether she's cooking the meals after Mr. jacks it up. And so she's just kind of like, you know, I want to know about this person. And so you see sort of this opening, and it's almost as if she recognizes that there's this this shell. Like you're saying, they both have different shells. Um, Celie has sort of withdrawn, and her development, this is my read, yours could be completely different. <laughs> I have this argument that when there is a lot of trauma in a person's life, that there are parts of their personality that will stay at that stage. So in Celie's case, there's the sexual assault, there's the violation of her body repeatedly, right. uh, the ill treatment of her. Um, you know, if there were social services, uh, her dad would be in a whole lot of trouble. But um, <laughs> there's all these things that are happening to her. I'll just say multiple traumas. And so part of her is still in that space. And so I feel like there's an element of her that has that sort of childlike um, interest yeah. in Suge. 
And then as the two of them affirm and support each other, because I'm also thinking that if Alice Walker is a womanist, which she is, exactly. that part of this idea of womanism is that you're in community. It's not the story of one woman. It's the story of many women supporting and affirming and loving each other, uh, romantically or otherwise. And so I see that unfold in these relationships with Suge, with Sophia, even with Squeak. You know, one of the other interviewers I was talking to uh, mentioned sort of passingly that, you know, here's a woman who's involved with the man who is the love of your life, but you all can sit around the same table and there's, you know, civility. It's not like I got to tolerate her. It's, you know, there's a certain level of civility and you see that at the core, there's this affirmation and support for each woman finding her own voice. You know, Squeak says, you know, my name is Mary Agnes. Mary Agnes, right, she, right. She claims her space. And so you see all these women toward the end of the film sort of affirm who they are. And you see Sophia sort of come back full circle. You know, she's been quiet. She's had, you know, her life basically beaten out of her. And then you see that despite all that she's been through, that spirit, that essence of who she is, is still there. So if we accept the idea that nothing is lost, only forgotten, we see in Sophia that who she is, that, that fighter, that resistance, that rebellious spirit is there. It's just right. dormant. And it took the love, it took the warmth, it took the push of you know her sister circle, so to speak, to bring it back out. So it wasn't lost, it was only forgotten. So, this, you know, what comes to mind is when you mention, because you, you brought this up twice and you bring me back to her mom. So what I'm thinking to myself and just Sophia and Suge and Squeak, and let's just name, name everybody except for Nettie. I'm going to leave Nettie out for some reason. I'm not too sure quite yet why, but okay. that we play these different roles, right? So in a way, when... when when you think of Celie and she's looking at Suge and whatever that maternal thing is that's taking place. I mean, let's think about it. What role did Celie physically play? Celie right. physically right. played the maternal role. She took care of the house. She, she made sure that, you know, what, what a mother does, what a parent does. I need to make sure you're clean. I want to make sure that you have food. I want to make sure that you're getting better. I'm going to take the sick off, right on out of you. Like she's doing all of those things. But on the other hand, whereas that the, that's the physical aspect, because that's the training. That's what we know. That's the upbringing. That's Tracy's upbringing. Tracy, do you know how to cook food for the people who are coming over? Yes. So I, uh, there's that kind of responsibility that we know how to do physically. But then right. there's the mental, spiritual, all the other things in terms of how do we develop from inward to outward. And so at that point, I'm thinking that's when she's looking at Suge. And she's looking at whatever that role is, like she has something. She does the same thing to Sophia, right? Because Sophia's like this strong, massive character being beat down. Right? And, mm -hmm. and I think... I think what I feel or what I'm hearing or what I see is in many ways, all three of these women, they, they kind of come in and out of roles. So again, I'm blurring the lines with the book and, and the film, but they come in and out of roles. So in ways, Celie is mom on one end and she becomes sister on another end and she becomes supporter on another end and she becomes a couple of different roles where Shug does the same thing. I don't know if the film actually does that really well though. Like, okay. I know, I feel like this is something that I, I know with Celie because you see her journey, you understand her process and her journey from 14 years old all the way to the very end when she's like, dear God, dear everything, dear nature. But in the movie, we don't see dear God, dear. we just assume it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. We at the end because you still, you see this full glorious, kind of being that's coming into herself. Um, and and I, I think what the film doesn't, and I'm, and I'm just thinking hard, but what the film may not do or does not do is that we don't see the different elements and the different roles that people play, like the full development of it, because they only have how, how long to fit all that stuff and all these letters into 
<laughs> into a movie. Yeah. So you see, yeah, you're usually working with two hours, right? Two, two hours and change. In that particular time period, That's, that would be a very long movie. That'd be a very long movie. And so that means that Steven Spielberg can only give you a specific kind of shove so that we know that Celie's identity comes out of that um, and she can point to certain people that say, this is how I'm shaped. And this is the best way that I know how to be shaped. And I can point to Sophia and what she does. Like, I think it, favorite scene, no, not favorite scene, but one of the most, one of the greatest scenes is obviously, they're all at the, is it the Thanksgiving dinner table or the Christmas? Okay, table? okay. You know what goes down. Celie's like, it's been working in her. She pulls that knife <laughs> and she goes to, for Mr. Head and then, and, and it's, um, or neck. And, and all I, all I felt at that moment was, whoo, it's about time. Right. Like, really? When the, boom, it's about time. But where did she get that power from? Right, like the, and and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, if she didn't have the Sophias going to prison <laughs> and then coming mm-hmm. out, or Suge being as free sh- as she is, comes in with a boxer. I'm um, talking about no, he's not a boxer. She, he's not a boxer, but comes in with her boyfriend, and is like, I'm in love. Like if if it hadn't been for those specific moments, Squeak and whomever else saying all the things. Would Celie have ever gotten to that moment, right? And mm-hmm. and at that point, Celie's no longer the little girl. Or any, right. yeah, I mean, and and let's move beyond the fact that you can look at her and know that she's an older woman because she has gray and you see the wrinkles or whatever the case may may be. Because I believe that there are people. If we dismiss age and what we look like as we're getting older, um, there are people who are childlike at what fifty years old, sixty, seventy. I mean, we. Mm-hmm. I I think of my dad who's still he's still well he's getting a little tired but he's still playing and traveling and I'm like eh, aren't you tired yet dad and so I think for me what I see is Celie how did you get to that point where you're like you're no longer the kid or the little girl or the whatever that that thing is how did you get to the point where you're just like I'm done I'm I'm about to take you out <laughs> right now and and let's be honest even at that point when she's like all i'm not gonna say all woman but where it's where there's just a womanness in even that moment where she's through she still has her sister circle right there saying silly don't do it you know Mm -hmm. right like you have you have sophia who's like don't trade places because i i need you to not do that right now you have suge who's like um let's go baby let's (laughs) right right and that's a, that's a good supportive system because, you know, some people will be like, hey, I will hold anybody else back. We can bury the body in the backyard, make it happen. There you but go. <laughs> you know, they do hold it down like, hold on, hold on. And, that's and maybe that's the, um, the Hollywood version. Maybe there's like a, a writer's cut somewhere where Mr. body's laid up. But, you know, of course not because in the novel right. they have some reconciliation. But, yeah, I mean, I, I could see that being an alternative ending, you know, if – that the color purple came out in today's context. We have like all these different cuts on the DVD Blu-ray disc, and then you got the one where well, Mister is assassinated. He he ends up dead <laughs> in that one. I mean, you know, right? And you know what's funny? That's twenty. I feel like that's so twenty fifteen, or maybe that's. I mean, there's there's this book that. You, you shape the context based off of the environment and what's taking place, right? Um, and, and for the longest time, I'll be honest, I didn't even, under, I didn't fully grasp when, I think when I started reading the book, I didn't fully grasp the time period. Yes, I saw the movie, but it wasn't until I realized, oh, she's mentioning Bessie Smith. Oh, she's mentioning certain people where I'm just like, look that up and figure that out. So in context, when I think of that particular scene, um, and, and she has her sister circle who still has her back. I'm thinking in terms of now when you were just like, Tracy, th- you know, the present day. You know, the present day, I'm looking at my small circle of girlfriends who were just like, let's take off the earrings. What, what, what you need me to do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to be right there at the door because I feel like my circle, which is Celie's circle, we're doing the same thing. We're loving. We may be doing it in a slightly different way. 
her circle says, Celia, I got your back, but given the time, I need you to not do that. My mm -hmm. circle may say, look, I got your back. We can take him out. We're not going to kill him, but we're going we're gonna to take him out. And we're going to handle our business today. There you go. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's similar. I think that is whether we're talking about 20s, 30s, 40s, all the way up to now, we're doing the same thing, which is why I go back to saying um, the Sealy and the Netties and the Squeaks and all, all in this world, they're, they're in 2015 that's not far removed from when this book was written. Absolutely. Absolutely. Black women's lives certainly matter then and they matter now. Yeah. And I think the film does... I mean, obviously, we can get into some of the issues, the, the pushback, but I think the film does do that. It does show the struggles, experiences, and stories of black women. And more often than not, those narratives aren't told as much as they should be. So, you know, we do have this document, this historical piece from the 80s in the film as well as in the book, and we can return to it. And, you know, one of the motivations for having this conversation is because these issues still matter. You know, when I first started the Purple Points, uh, there weren't these, these massive movements of Black Lives Matter. But as it's been going, Black Lives Matter has continued to echo, whether we're talking in Baltimore, St. Louis, California, and Oakland, wherever, we're having these same conversations. So it's extremely timely, uh, despite it being 30 years. So one last thought I wanted to leave you with. Okay. Uh, is there sort of... Um, I guess we could say the color purple isms. So one of the, the other interviewees that I talked to um, talked about until you do right by me, <laughs> everything you're gonna fail is sort of her thing. Uh, so Some another person mentioned um, God is trying to tell you something. So if you could think of a color purple ism, uh, what outside of those, what would it be, and why does it resonate? And we'll close out with that thought. Um, I think it's the it's the phrase where it brings the actual title back into the overarching thing. You know, they're in the field, and she was like, you know, I, I think that God gets pissed off. She talks about admiration, says, I think God gets pissed off when you don't even notice the color purple. Um, and even to this day, I'm still trying to explore what that means because I was trying to trace how many times they say <laughs> they say purple. But I, I, for me, at the end of the day, it is. And this is just where I am in my life. It is being mindful and in the moment. And mm -hmm. as it relates, my last thought is we're in a, in a world where technology in a way is driving how we operate and how we interact and how we communicate, you know? And, and you, Akil, it's just like, Trace, don't send me an email, give me a call. That's real talk, right? And so I, I think the book does the same thing. Notice what's around you. Notice the colors, notice everything. Be mindful and be very, be in the moment. Put the stuff down and be here. Yeah, that's it. That's, a, that's eloquent and I appreciate your time and I thank you for joining this edition of Purple Points. So for those of you out there who are watching, make sure you log on to the Phoenix Rising Collective and you check out some of the writing by Dr. Curry. She is the creativity and arts person, so she is off and writing. And I hope you tune in and join us for the next installment of Purple Points. Thank you for watching. Thanks. <laughs>